Right. So without further ado, I think it's important that we start talking about wine. Um, now, Catherine and I are really excited about tonight's tasting for many, many reasons. But firstly, it gives Catherine and I an opportunity to virtually um, zoom around, literally and figuratively, um, our favourite, some, I should say, some of our favourite French regions, not all of them, but um, six is a decent number. And the fact that we can't have all of them means we will have another chance to do another similar event with some different regions another time. Um, and it's also our first event where the wines are available in half bottles. So Catherine, I know that you live alone. And even though I live with a fiance that drinks like a fish, um, we do recognize that opening six full size bottles on a Tuesday is uh, perhaps excessive to some, maybe not to others. Um, but hopefully the fact that every one of these wines has been available in a half means that many of you will have been able to join us and buy them. Even if you haven't bought any of them, I hope that you've opened something similar from your own cellar or your own wine rack. Um, but if you have managed to get your hands on any of the halves, then we're going to talk um, about the regions in generally, but we're going to give you a bit of information on those specific wines as well throughout the course of the session. So the evening's designed to be a bit of a tour de France. Um, and Catherine, I think, is going to kindly share the map of where we're going to be tasting from this evening. Um, we've done a bit of a, um, a strange one, shall we say. We're going to try and go north to south. Um, it means that we're starting with the Pinot Gris, but there is method in our madness um, because the Pinot Gris is unoaked. So if we're going from top to bottom with a little diversion in between, uh, you'll see up there, I've circled the regions we're going for. We're going to start with Alsace and the Pinot Gris, then to Burgundy, which is that red section. We're then going to zoom literally right down following one of the best drives in France, I have to say, down through Beaujolais, through the Northern Rhone, down into the Southern Rhone. But before we did hit the Rhone, we're going to nip over to Bordeaux. So don't worry, we'll tell you, um, we'll tell you the drinking order as we go. But if you just want to start off, then we are going to go Alsace, then Burgundy for the whites. So without further ado, let's get tasting, let's get talking. I think you've heard quite enough of me. Um, so the first wine of the evening is, I'll show you the bottle, but then we do also have a screen grab of the website. I'll show you the bottle, but I'm going to then talk about Alsace in general. So hopefully you can see that, but don't worry if you can't, because really the main thing about this bottle is the shape of it. So this is the Pinot Gris Classic from Famille Hugel, 2019. Um, what, what is the main difference between this and all of the other bottles? Um, it is the shape of it. It's a flute shape. And I will tell you a little bit about why that is in just a moment. Um, but yes, yeah, so the Alsace region is, uh, I think we've got hopefully a little screenshot about to jump up, but the Alsace region is a very unusual part of France. For anyone less familiar with it, a great place to travel. It effectively hugs the border of Germany. And uh, because of that, here we go. You'll have to apologize, by the way, this evening. Our maps don't look identical, but we've picked the best maps to suit our purpose this evening. So they might not all look as perhaps jazzy, uh, but they really do serve a purpose. Here you can see it literally hugs the side of a mountain and that's called the Vosges mountain. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But then the other side of that, we've got the Black Forest and the German border. Now, that uh, mountain hugging position, weaseling its way down uh, that borderline, means that it has actually swapped ownership over the years. So Alsace now is French, but between 1879 and 1945, it swapped between French and Germanic ownership. Um, there were times when different wineries would have different generations that spoke German or French. Um, and that has naturally influenced the winemaking. So Alsace sits as a bit of a, a different region compared to the rest of France. Not only the bottle shape, by law, the wines of Alsace, still wines of Alsace are bottled in flutes, but also the fact that they label by varietal. Now, this is the only wine of the whole evening where you learn the name of the grape variety on the front of the label. 
And that's a very German thing to do. Uh, it's not a French thing to do. The French like to um, the French like to label by appellation, so they like to say where it's from rather than what it is. Um, but Alsace is very different to that. So that's the key difference, and that's its point of interest, I would say. Uh, it also makes wine from really different grape varieties. So um, things like Riesling are found here, the Pinot Gris that we've got, Gewurztraminer. Those are not commonly found across the whole of France. So it really does sit as a sort of law unto itself. Now, Catherine, I think we've got a picture of the Vosges, well, a diagram, I should say, of the Vosges Mountains. And sorry to make you jump slightly, because I know it's the last diagram of, of the pictures of Alsace, but I want to talk to you about why um, geographically and terroir wise, um, this is a particularly special region. Um, any sort of wine course you do, this is one of the things that you learn quite early on. But even though Alsace is so far north, it actually has an incredible amount of sunshine. So it's got about 1800 hours of sunshine a year and a staggeringly low rainfall. The only wine growing region with less rainfall in the whole of France is actually down in the south, so the Languedoc Roussillon area. So, the reason for that is these, this mountain range, the green hill that you can see there and the blue hills behind it, uh, the rain comes along from the west, it hits those mountains and it falls on the opposite side to, of the mountains. So what that means is you get these beautiful plains um, and then incredible steep slopes that are basically just bathing in the sunshine and actually don't have a huge amount of rainfall. So um, the grapes get incredibly concentrated. Uh, they also ripen really nice and slowly, which means that they can gather more flavor in a way. There's not really a better way to describe it, but it means that you can get really, really concentrated, intense, rich, unctuous, luscious wines from this area. Um, the, because of these slopes, they do have to do a lot of hand harvesting and arguably that makes the quality even better as well because you could pick the best grapes when you're in the vineyard. So thank you, Catherine. I think we've also got a picture just to show people of those, those real slopes. I think it's back one. Perfect, if you can see it. This is a, um, oh, this is the, Ger this is Hugel, who we're gonna talk about in a minute, but this just shows the Germanic influence. It's influenced the bottle shape, the food, the wine. Oh, apologies. Let me come out, I'll go back in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I made it more challenging for Catherine by changing <laughs> what I was talking. Um, but yes, yeah, so you've got Germanic influence in not only the bottles, the varieties they grow, the food, the architecture, all sorts of things. Um, Catherine's going to show us the slopes in a minute, but I'm going to jump right onto grapes. So hopefully you've kept there that. There we go, we've got the slope. Oh, look at that. Now that just shows these kind of beautiful undulating slopes. And this is actually um, not even the edge of the Vosges Mountains, but it's still, they're sort of like mini Vosges that, that um, sort of slowly temper down. Um, and this is just such a classic uh, image of Alsace. And you can see vineyards everywhere. It really, really is blessed with the most incredible sights. A lot of people say it's the most beautiful vineyard region in France. And I think that's probably quite hard to dispute. Um, they mainly grow white wines. So it's around 90% of all the grapes are white. Um, and of those things like Riesling, Gewurztramina and Pinot Blanc actually make up the most. So Pinot Gris is not in the top three varieties, but we think that this is a particularly interesting wine. So if anyone's got the Pinot Gris, give me a wave. I'm, uh, I'm excited. Oh yes, we've got a few of you, brilliant. Even if you don't have this Pinot Gris, uh, what I'm about to tell you is really relevant to all Pinot Gris from Alsace. Um, so I'm gonna smell and talk as I go, but um, Pinot Gris is not Pinot Grigio, and that's the first thing to say. So uh, they are two different beasts. They might be related and they might be from the same sort of mother grape, um, but they are grown completely differently. And also um, through the ages and through the fact that they're grown in two completely different places, um, over time cultivars have slightly diverged. It's a bit like two twins 
who went on different career paths. Um, so whilst they might be the same, they're very, very different. Um, many people actually believe that Pinot Gris is one of, is one of if not the greatest ageable grape varieties grown in Alsace. And it gives Riesling a run for its money, which most people would say is the best for aging. But I think Pinot Gris does some really interesting things when it ages. And really you only get quality grapes can age. So this is very different. Um, if you have got some, have a smell. It probably won't smell anything like Pinot Grigio if you've had one of those, particularly over the weekend we had. If anyone did go out to a uh, pub, this is no disrespect, but chances are the first wine on the list was a Pinot Grigio. Chances are it looked like water. Um, you know, that's a really popular style in the UK. It's refreshing. It's, it's really light. That's not what's going to be in here. It's luscious. They tend to uh, have that longer growing season I spoke about, really accumulating more flavour. Um, they also, Hugel, who produced this particular wine, uh, they also have really low yields. So they don't produce volumes and volumes of juice. They keep their um, vines trained so, and grow their vines at a density that they don't produce too much juice because too much juice can sometimes make the diluted um, flavors, essentially. So... Yes, I mean, I'm keen just to get a taste on. So Catherine, you said you were going to taste whilst I talk. Did you manage to have a have a swig? I did. And I have um, made some notes as well. It's my sort of primary sort of flavours that I'm getting. It's very, it's, I mean, I've noticed someone said unctuous in the, um, in the chat. I agree, but the acidity is there. It freshens it up. So it's got that nice sort of, um, almost like baked orchard fruits so maybe like a little bit of yellow plum maybe some apricot a bit of peach or pear as well it's got a nice freshness from the fruit it's not been stewed but they've definitely had a bit more going to it that gives it um not a, a crispness but um a lightness to it couldn't agree more. And I like the unctuous term. I think we had a question in the chat to what extent is that unctuousness um, a char character down to the hot 2019 vintage. Yes, it is, um, but it's always made in this style by Hugel for the classic range. So, you know, if you had a colder vintage, you're not going to expect it to, to lose much of that. They, the reason is um, they do keep it on the vine longer. So in this hot year, 2019, chances are they'll have actually picked it earlier than normal maybe by a couple of weeks so that they don't get hot and flabby and high alcohol and low acid because the longer you leave the grapes the alcohol rises but the acid tends to drop so they will have picked it a bit earlier than they normally might have done but actually in relative terms because they have this gorgeous weather and these lovely long cool but dry autumns they'll have they'll have kept it on the vine a bit longer. I should also mention that Hugel are particularly famous for actually producing a start or creating, inventing um, sweet wines that really you keep on the vine up until Christmas. Mm. And then they betritize, or so many of you will know the Vendage Tardive style or Selection Guan um, Nobile. And those are uh, styles that were basically pioneered by Hugel. So they are a, a domain that is well versed in this, um, in this particular long long leaving of grapes on vine so i'm keen to know what you all think write it in the chat but i'm also conscious that i am taking i'm eating into catherine's time on burgundy before <laughs> i hand over i will just um answer verbally michael's question which was uh should we be opening any of the reds now my view is if you have enough glasses luckily i've got some tasting glasses here feel free to open them and pour them and if you want to open them, absolutely. But don't fear, these are not wines that are going to need really, really long um, decanting. So if you haven't opened them, then it's really not a problem at all. A good swirl in the glass for a couple of seconds will do wonders for the oak decanter would have done. So enough from me. I must be quiet. <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> I'm excited for Burgundy. You've got me now for the next three wines. I've got the three Bs this evening. So we are indeed going on to Burgundy. I think, Anna, you may have um, a map there ready to go. If not, we'll wait a moment, but it covers quite a wide area. So you've got the 
very cool um, continental in sort of climate in the, the far north around Chablis and then further down into the south you're looking at a more moderate uh, continental climate. As you'll have probably no doubt seen recently the weather can be quite temperamental in this region so you've got the rain that comes in the early summer and harvest and then you've got some summer hail that can have a big effect and you've also got the spring frosts this year we're seeing that on a, a much bigger scale and a much more detrimental effect to vineyards in terms of rot as well there is also um, some grey rot can occur and that will have quite an effect on the Pinot Noir, which is um, quite susceptible to it. In terms of the varieties in Burgundy, mainly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Chardonnay equates for nearly half the total vineyard area, and it can vary from the kind of lean, steely styles in Chablis down to the fuller bodied, uh, richer styles that you get in the Macanay in the south. The Pinot Noir equates for about a third of the total vineyard area, and it's grown throughout the region, but is mostly um, the most important regions, sort of areas for it within the region would be the Cote d'Or. They also do grow some Aligot and some Gamay. The Aligot does quite a nice light, um, fairly inoffensive white, and the Gamay a little bit down in the south of the region, verging into Beaujolais almost. The soils are quite varied. They change significantly over small areas, but the main takeaway is that the slopes of Burgundy have shallower soils with better drainage. So those are the premium sites for vineyards and the flats have deeper, more fertile soil. So if you're um, more bulk made wine, they are more likely to be located there. The Appalachians are based on the quality of the vineyard sites and about half of the total production um, of regional sort of Bourgogne Blanc and Bourgogne Rouge is around the, the regional Appalachians. You've also got some um, commune Appalachians that equate for about a third of the total production. And then you have single vineyards, which consists of the really high quality Premier Cruise, uh, which is around the tenth of the production and Grand Cruise, which equates to little more than 1% of the total production, but their prestige is very well known. I think we've got a picture of the Roche de Salutre, which is in the cradle of Puy Puisse, um, in the cradle of the Macne. Lovely. So that is a sort of a limestone rock face it always reminds me a little bit of pride rock from the lion king um, and that is where some of the more premium uh, vines are grown for the uh, pui puise macane wines if we go on to the society's white burgundy which i will show you now let me grab my little bottle there we go lovely we've got a little screen share for you as well let me get it on the camera so this wine actually quite interestingly is um, made through a negociant and it's a negociant based in Beaujolais and the, the interesting thing about this is the buyer that is responsible for the blending of this isn't Toby Morrill who you might expect it to be it's actually Tim Sykes our Beaujolais buyer so because he has such a good working relationship with the um, Le, Vin, Le Vin Anjou who are the negotiants, he is responsible for the um, blending of this. So we have the consistency there. It's made from the top villages in the Machinay. It's 100% Chardonnay. They vinify it on stainless steel and it's kept on its leaves until the springtime. So it's got some texture and purity as well. In terms of the leaves, if you're not familiar with what those are, um, in not too glamorous a way, they are basically the dead yeast cells that are present in the production of the wine. And it sits on the lees and they give a nice sort of doughy, bit yeasty, um, a little bit like baker's yeast. Not quite, um, not all, with this wine, it's not quite a biscuity, bready character and it's not the toasty quality that you would get from oak. 
this doesn't have any oak with it. So it's more of a fresh yeast um, and a nice bit of texture to the wine. Anna, I can see you've been sipping away as we go. Uh, we are both on the spittoons this evening as we're doing the, the six wines, but what, what are you thinking? Yeah, so I love this wine and there's a reason it's our best-selling uh, wine as well at the Wine Society. It's a really fantastic, great value um, white burgundy, I think. Um, for me, comparing it to the last wine is really interesting because this is much fresher for me. And where you had that kind of more baked apple, this is more like biting into a proper Granny Smith type feeling. Wow. Um, I love how much my mouth is watering. I get a bit of a lemony thing as well. It's not super, it's not lemon, 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 um, like you might get from something like a Sauvignon from the Loire. Instead, it's just that zing. Um, and then I love the lees texture. Now, because some people can be a bit anti-oak because of the flavors sometimes that oak can bring. And lees, I love the idea that it's like an alternative. It gives you, there's, there's that lovely feeling in my mouth and it's a little bit doughy, but it's not... Um, overpowering it's a beautiful compliment I'd say Catherine mm, absolutely it's it, that texture that's there and the the acidity as well I think make it a really nice sort of foody wine as well obviously we've got a fish on the label um, I think one of my favorite things to have it with is something like a fish pie or some fish cakes it's you know something with a little bit of you're balancing that slight butteriness um, and the freshness and maybe some lemon there it works beautifully do let us know what, what you're thinking, if you've got that. And if you do have any questions, pop them in. Gil will try and get them to us. If not, we can try and answer them at the end um, or we'll go throughout. But if we're happy, I think we'll go on to the Beaujolais. Let me just... Whilst you're pouring that, Catherine, Scarlett and Max had a lovely point that um, it was very, I think, restrained was the word or something. Yeah, restrained. And I think that's a nice way to describe that wine. It doesn't hit you over the head. It's a Chardonnay with class, that one. It's a nice entry um, white burgundy, I think. Nice entry level. And John has asked Catherine, just before we zoom on, um, how long will this keep? Uh, he is on a half of the 2018, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was better last year. I'm assuming, John, you mean that 18 is better than the 19. Seems to, oh, you, you drank it last year and it tasted better. So Seems to have lost acidity and zing. I mean, the half bottles will mature that bit sooner than a full bottle um so you will find that that they will sort of lose its pep a little bit and i would i think we say sort of drink within the two years of purchase for this one so that makes sense if you had the 2018 and we're now sort of three years three years after although our drink dates are a little bit conservative for this it's not got that much complexity and length to it that you would see um the, the development and it's also not so high in acidity or so concentrated in flavor that it's got the structure to, to stand with um, withstand long-term aging so I would go for the um, maybe sort of within the two years you can drink it after one but you will find that it will just sort of be a little bit duller and I have just seen that Helen and Trevor have said has it gone through malolactic fermentation so I don't think this actually does. I think it's just the lees that gives it the texture. And because of that, they don't feel the need to um, put it through the malolactic. But white Burgundy, a Chardonnay from Burgundy. I mean, Burgundy is a region that was sort of a pioneer for one of those techniques for premium Chardonnay. So malolactic fermentation or conversion, as I think it's now referred to, is the conversion of uh, malic acid to lactic acid, which can give Chardonnays and burgundies that um sort of a creamy yogurty character which this one doesn't have um but you will probably find that as chardonnays as you drink them that you'll have you'll come across that as you go lovely Catherine are you ready for me to pop up the old yes let map so members we're on to the Beaujolais now very far um because it's right next to the Machinay, the South Machinay. We're just hopping down into Beaujolais. So this is the Society's Beaujolais Village. There we go, that we're going to talk about very shortly. The climate um, in Beaujolais is sort of a moderate continental climate and they can produce 
red, rosé and white wines, but it is the red wines made with the grape Gamay that dominates. And Gamay is quite an early budding and early ripening variety. So it does need good management or it can have some um, quite unruly large yields, which do produce some lower quality wines. I don't know if anyone is budding gardener here, but this is one of the ways that I find best to understand and best to um, explain it is that if you are growing a, a plant, a flowering plant or um, a fruit giving plant, you want your plant to have, you don't want just leaves. You don't want it to have such a luscious um, in growing environment that it just produces lots of lovely green leaves. You want it to have a little bit of stress and a little bit of control and a little bit of pruning. So it produces those flowers and it produces the fruit. There's um, one way that they do have this control is with the traditional pruning method, which is of the goblet vines, which I think we've got a lovely picture of now. So once that pops up, you'll see they're sort of quite rounded. The, the spurs are sort of pulled in at the top um, and they're like little, if I use my hands, that's probably the best way. <laughs> they're sort of little goblet vines and it keeps the yields low, but unfortunately it does mean that it's quite hard to, um, to harvest or to manage mechanically. So a lot of growers in the region are now doing wire, um, sort of growing the vines along wires to aid with the mechanization, but it is still a good method for keeping the yields low. The other thing is choosing where you're going to grow your vines or where your vineyard is placed. So the granite soils in Beaujolais also offer um, a lower yield, but a higher quality. Again, you're putting the, the vines under that little bit of stress. You're not giving them too much of an easy time to grow. And it means that they concentrate their efforts to the fruit rather than just being lots of lovely leaves. They make very fragrant wines. You've got a lot of raspberry and cherry with some medium tannins and body. Um, they also benefit from being quite nicely chilled for a little bit. That's how you'll find it a lot in bistros in France. In terms of the appellations, you've got Beaujolais and Beaujolais Nouveau, which is your sort of lower level basic um, wines. I'll come on to Beaujolais Nouveau in a, quickly in a moment. You've also then got the Beaujolais Village, which is what the society's wine is. Um, and then some Beaujolais Cru. So those are based more in the north and west of the region. They've got some rolling hills with the granite soils. There's 39 villages in Beaujolais that can call themselves Beaujolais Village. They do tend to be blends and the individual, individual name is rarely on the label. And then you've got 10 villages which are entitled to their own appellation of Beaujolais Cru. Four of the most um, prominent that you'll probably recognise are Bruy, Morgon, Fleury and Moulin Avant. Now Beaujolais Nouveau is something that we get asked about quite often because it's not a wine that we actually um, stock and there's a lot of hype around it. If you're not familiar with what Beaujolais Nouveau is, it is a wine from the sort of Beaujolais region. I don't know if we've got a map, Anna, that we can just um, bring up perhaps. So the Beaujolais region in Beaujolais is sort of to the east and south of the, um, the main region as a whole. I think it's in the lightest pink colour on this map for you. And it lies in the alluvial soils of the River San. And the alluvial soils are just sort of a mixture of um, soils that have been deposited over time from surface water. So they're a bit richer in minerals and they're not as um, stress inducing as the, the granite soils. Now, the Beaujolais, so the Gamay grown here is often used for Beaujolais Nouveau, which is an early drinking style of Beaujolais, which can't be released until the third Thursday in November of that vintage. And then it can't be sold after the following 31st of August. It's got a bit of a cult status. Um, it can only be Beaujolais or Beaujolais for large quality. And it's very light in body and tannin. It's got some real red berry, kirsch, banana and cinnamon um, flavors because they use of carbonic maceration. Carbonic maceration is a method that is used throughout Beaujolais, not just for the um, more lower level wines, but it's used more carefully 
in the wines that are a little bit more higher quality. Now, carbonic maceration is where the whole uncrushed bunches are put into vats. They add some CO2, which removes the oxygen, then some intracellular fermentation starts. The alcohol reaches about 2% and the skins split and the juice is seeping out. They then press the grapes to separate the juice from the skins and the yeasts complete the um, fermentation, which is a, it's a way to get some good color in the wine without having the tannins as well. I mean, Beaujolais is quite famously a very light tannic wine. The semi-carbonic maceration works in a similar fashion, but instead of adding carbon dioxide, they let it naturally occur by having the weight of whole bunches crush the grapes on the bottom, which they then release some juice and start the fermentation, which releases a bit of carbon dioxide and it works its way around the vat. Um, so you don't get quite as strong a sort of Kirsch um, bone banana flavor, but you get it a little bit. So it adds a little bit of depth and dimension to your resultant wine. So the Society's Beaujolais Village, again, it is from Le Vin Anjou, which is the negotiant um, in Beaujolais. They've been our um, negotiant and sort of support provider for the Beaujolais Village for the last 50 years. So it's a very good working relationship that we have with them. And our man on the ground is Jean-Marc de Bon. Um, the grapes are mainly from the southern end of the village appellation, and they're grown on light sandy soils from weathered granite so got a good amount of granite but it's not the it's not the top level um but we've got enough granite that we make a really nice sort of medium body it's fresh and fruity i actually um, enjoyed this wine when we last could travel on the eurostar to paris i felt it was very bistro inspired we managed to get some cheese and some bread and slightly chilled Beaujolais Village because it had been in my backpack as I've trekked across London. So it worked really lovely. Um, and it, I think it's one of my favourite wines. I think it's an all weather wine as well, all seasons. It's not very chic of you, Catherine. I know, it was very fun. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking your Beaujolais Village on the Eurostar to Paris. I did it out of a plastic cup, which I'm <laughs> lowered it ever so slightly, but it was very enjoyable. <laughs> Oh, I think I'd give anyone on a uh, anyone in a plastic cup on the Eurostar right now. So any receptacle would go for me. <laughs> well, I agree with you, Catherine. Lovely wine. Um, the berries are very prevalent. Mm. Um, and for me, actually, I was pleasantly surprised with the tannins. I think everyone always thinks of Beaujolais as being a bit of a, not the cruise, um, but Beaujolais village level or Beaujolais as being a bit of a easy wine and maybe too easy sometimes but actually this has a little uh, a little sort of structural component but like you say you could still drink it chilled and have it relaxed um Absolutely. so yeah a good all-rounder I think as well often we talk about you know we've just looked at Burgundy and obviously you've got Pinot Noir in Burgundy which again is another slightly lower tannin wine to red wine as a whole I think Pinot Noir from Burgundy can have that sort of austere quality. So although it's lower tannin, that can be quite harsh. The, the tannin in the Beaujolais is apparent, but I think the softness of the fruit, so it's like the softer um, sort of raspberry and strawberry and really ripe cherry means that the tannins are that bit more approachable. Whereas if you've got slightly crunchier fruit, sort of cranberry and red currant of a Pinot Noir, it can make the, the tannins that bit more austere. Yeah, it's not lip puckering, is it? No, they're, kind there. Of they're there and it doesn't fall apart, but they're there in a way that it's, it's very pleasant to drink. It's quite um, velvety and smooth. Hmm. Good stuff. Hopefully a few of you have tried it along with us. Let us know what you think as well in the... Uh... In the chat, I think Ian, we've answered your question, or rather, Catherine's answered your question. Um, Alan has said, "Does anyone bother with Beaujolais Nouveau these, these days?" I, I don't know. I don't want to make a broad statement here. I don't know if people bother with it seriously. If that makes sense, I think it's quite a fun thing, um, and I think there's a lot of buzz around it, particularly in the in the wine trade. That there's, you know, there's something fun, and there's always things that are a bit promotional. Um, around it that's more what I see rather than it being a 
a really serious contender. But if it's a way to get people into drinking Beaujolais, I'm all for it. I agree. And if you really want to go and have some fun, I think you can bathe in baths of it in Japan. Yeah. So <laughs> if that's if that's on your bucket list, I'm going to go with the Paris on the Eurostar. But if you fancy it, you can also go to Japan and sit in a hot tub full of it. <laughs> Fabulous. Right, Catherine, I am ready with a map of Bordeaux if you're ready with a, with a little bit of info. I am. Fantastic. Okay. We're on to Bordeaux. Now, I'll do Bordeaux first as a bit of information and then um, we'll talk about the wine. But if you would like to pour a glass and have a sip while I talk, we are doing the um, Chateau Lalonde, sorry, the Chateau de la Commandere. Lalonde Pomerol. So this is what we are on to next. So Bordeaux, it's the largest Appalachian region in France. It's home to many fine wines, but also many um, entry level everyday table wines. It does across the board. You've got some red, white, rosé and sweet from Bordeaux. You can get a bit of everything there really. If we get the map up, so it's a moderate maritime climate. Now you'll see there is a lot of water around Bordeaux. So you've got the um, Atlantic on the left. So it's the Bay of Biscay on the left there. And the it really does benefit from the Gulf Stream that comes in. So it's the warm ocean current that extends the growing season. Um, so you can be sort of harvesting as late as October in, in Bordeaux. It does, however, also bring um, rainfall and humidity, but you do get a element of protection from the Lons forest and the sand dunes that are on the, the west of the region. There we go. I think Anna's just doing the diagram there. So the rain does fall throughout the year, um, which means there is quite a bit of vintage variation. If we could just pop back to the map, lovely. So we've got the Gironde estuary, which then splits into the Dordogne and the Garonne rivers. Um, and if we then move back to the photo, I think that just shows you a little bit of the, um, the size, if anything, the, of, of the water and the sheer volume of water that is surrounding this region. Um, and you can actually surf down at the, uh, the Garonne, I think it is, or the Garonne. There is a current that runs through it. It's, it's a very wide body of water. Because of the unpredictability with the weather, almost all of the reds and most of the whites are blends, um, just so that you know they've got some consistency in the wine. They can tailor it to have the, the desired um, qualities that they want without having to sort of uproot vines each year. So working as a blend just helps have that control of consistency because like I said, the vintage variation is, is a big impact in Bordeaux. So for the reds, it's predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and in hot years, um, a little bit of Petit Verdot, but that's more of a bit of a minor player and it's never seen out of a blend. Um, it's not one that can stand on its own. In terms of whites, you've got Semillon, very important in the sweet wines of Sauterne, uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Muscadel as well offers a little bit um, of a, a lighter floral grapey element to the sweet whites. There's a variation in winemaking across the region. Um, it depends on the style that the producers want and also on their available resources. It's, it's a real, the variety is one of the big things, I think, for Bordeaux. You've got some huge producers that have got a lot of everything. They've got some really nice old barrels. Then you've got smaller producers that are making nice wines, but they've got staves and, and chips. So it really depends on what's available, what they can use, what works with the um, with the harvest that they've got. So you're looking at oak barrels, steel, um, concrete for fermentation, again, dependent on the style. As well as dry whites, of course, you've got the sweet wines of Bordeaux. So you've got um, your Sauterne, or if you want to go that bit more quality, you can go for a Barsac in the, the region. Excuse me. And in terms of the 
main regions of Bordeaux or perhaps the appellations of Bordeaux, the Dordogne and the Garonne actually make three kind of distinct areas um, where they split from the Gironde estuary. So perfect, so we've got the map again. So to the north and to the east of the Gironde and the Dordogne, so you, yep, where the curta is now, you've got sort of saint million Pomerol, um, that's what we would refer to as the right bank uh, or the Libonais, as down it says at the bottom. And then between the, um, to the, the west, there we go, where's my northeast and west? So the west of the Gironde and the Garonne, you've got Medoc, Graves, um, and then down in the south, so turn, and that is the left bank. And then between the Dordogne and the Garonne, you've got the Entre de Mer. So it's, I think it, Trans, my French isn't great, so it translates into between the two waves or two tides, I think, is the, the middle. So you've got those three sort of sections. In terms of the soils between the left bank and the right bank, the right bank is a more clay soil, so it will predominantly grow Merlot in terms of the reds. The left bank has more of a sandy gravelly soil, so it's better suited to Cabernet Sauvignon which has the slightly thicker skin and it needs um, a bit more warmth to, to ripen through. There are over 50 different appellations in Bordeaux. Unlike Burgundy, it's not as neat in the hierarchy um, in terms of being based on quality. So you've got sort of Bordeaux and Bordeaux Superior as your generic red, white and rosé. You've then also got some classifications which are generally more focused on the individual estate um, or chateau as they'd be referred to rather than the vineyards themselves. So you consider the, the chateau as perhaps the brand to follow um, rather than the vineyard because over the years the vineyard size of that particular chateau may grow or shrink depending on sort of family relations if you know they want to sell off some vines or if they just want to buy some more because they've come into some um, good fortune. It's, it's more of the, the chateau that you want to, well, not want to follow, but you can follow and have more of a um, sort of understanding and a, a stylistic approach from the chateaus. The one that we have this evening, which is the Chateau de la Commanderie, so it's the Lombe de Pomerol, so it's on the right bank, this is where I get my left and my right mixed up, <laughs> so it's on the right bank, um, and it's, it's around... It's predominantly Merlot and it is owned by the Lafon family. They have a 26 hectare vineyard that's planted to 75% Merlot, 20% Cabernet Franc and 5% Cabernet Sauvignon. So the Cabernet Franc and the Cabernet Sauvignon help just add that little bit of structure to the plushness of the Merlot. The harvesting is done by machine and they have three weeks of vatting followed by aging in barrel and vat. Chateau de la Commanderie is actually situated next to the church, which was one of the commanderies set up by the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem to protect the pilgrims on their travels to Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain. So very old. Um, I think it's got a lot of supple fruit. It's quite plummy. Uh, it's got sloes and damson as well. It's, it's quite a mid-weight Bordeaux. Um, Personally, I prefer left bank because I, I prefer Cabernet Sauvignon, but this one, in terms of wanting a plush wine, it, it really does it. Yeah, I think it for me, it's just plum, plum, plum. And mm. then I actually got a touch of, um, I don't know whether any members felt the same, but um, the aromatic was quite lifted. And what I mean by that is almost like a little bordering on licorice. It's not mm. licorice, but it's got that kind of herbaceous, nose to it which i really like about right bank wines actually because they're kind of uh they can they can have when there's some fronk in the blend a little bit of whoo, bit yeah. of pep um lovely wine catherine i hope members are also enjoying it do let us know what you think um i'm conscious of time but what i would say is the next two wines are both from the rhone so i'll be able to squidge them together a little more easily but we'll probably be running over by about five minutes so if you've got something in the oven, maybe turn it down a few degrees. <laughs> if you fancy staying with us an extra five minutes, we'd love to keep you here if, you, if you're if you able to. Um, but yes, thank you, Catherine. That was a scrummy wine. 
I've actually very nearly finished all three of your samples. So um, <laughs> yes, danger. Um, luckily spitting, otherwise we'd, we'd be in for a rough ride, I think, for the final two wines. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to talk about the Rhone and I'm going to talk about the north of the Rhone first and the south of the Rhone afterwards. Um, and you might think, why did you include two Rhone wines? Um, firstly, the Rhone is a bit of a, a special place for me. My parents live in the southern Rhone, so I really enjoy the wines of the Rhone and drink them regularly. But also um, just to show the difference, actually, because the North Rhone and the South Rhone, really, most wine trady people think should probably be um, two different uh, appellations or, or two different regions. I should say they are two different appellations, but two completely different groups. So hopefully we have a map available to us, dear Catherine, but um, don't worry if not immediately I can, oh, there it comes, lovely. So here is the Rhone in general. You'll see the top skinny bit. Uh, so to give you some reference, we've literally traveled directly down from Beaujolais. So not from the last wine, that was Bordeaux, we zoomed over to the coast, but from the wine before, that lovely, juicy, um, sort of uh, delicious quaffer, um, we've zoomed down from there and now we've hit the Northern Rhone. Um, you've come through Lyon and there are a series of incredibly steep, beautiful slopes in the Northern Rhone. And you travel down all of those. I've got a photo to show you in the moment. Um, you then actually drive for quite a while down the Rhone River with no vineyards and then suddenly you are in effectively a basin and flat plain and that's the southern Rhone and because geologically they're incredibly different the wines are, are very different as well they share some common grape varieties that I'll mention in a moment but actually stylistically um, kind of the, the the ethos but mainly the production is incredibly incredibly different um, and the climate is too so that northern section that little um tiny bit hugging the river that only makes up about three to five percent depending on the vintage of the whole region so it's tiny tiny production levels um the main grape grown here is syrah now i mentioned that the two places have very different uh, climates. The climate is so different that Grenache, the grape that's down in the south that we're going to taste in a moment, can't fully ripen here. It needs more warmth and it needs more heat. The difference is that extreme. Um, the other key difference, and I think Catherine has a photo to show you, are the slopes in the north. The steep slopes of the north. I think there, there's a sort of saying in the wine trade, if you want to do the hardest vintage, i.e. grape picking of your life, go to the northern Rhone because um, it's so steep. And I don't think this even does it remotely justice, but what you will see is lots of walls. Um, and the walls are there basically to stop the earth rolling down the hill when it rains. And they are built up and producers spend a lot of money looking after them. But those incredible slopes actually give this region the style of wine. They have incredible sun exposure, not dissimilar to the Alsace wines we were talking about earlier. Um, even one of the Appalachian um, gets its name from it. It's called Cote Roti, which means roasted slope. Um, and that's an appellation that makes red, red only from Syrah. But the appellation we have in our first glass, so in the Rose Hermitage, Domaine de Thalabert, um, which is made by Jabalé, Paul Jabalé Um, This is a Rose Hermitage. And Rose Hermitage, you've probably all heard of Hermitage. Um, now, Hermitage is probably the most famous um, appellation in the Northern Rhone, arguably, um, if not the most famous, certainly in the top three. And it makes incredible quality wine from both red and white. And Croise Hermitage is basically on the other side. So it doesn't hug the river quite the same. Um, there are two parts to the appellation. There's like a flat plain at the bottom, which is nice. Um, and then there's also the hill on the other side. Now, the flat plain near the river makes slightly less interested, interesting wine, but behind the hill on the mid slope, effectively just down from the famous Hermitage, um, makes incredibly, incredibly good value Northern Rhone. Because the one other difference about the North and the South, if you didn't already know it, you will learn quickly, is the price. So here we are in the Croise Hermitage. Um, you are 
bound to get far more expensive wines in that northern part but of course you are did you see how hard it was to pick the grapes um we've already talked about the fact that one of the grape varieties in the south can't even ripen there some years syrah um has problems because of the wind so it's a high risk oh i've got a fly apologies it's a high risk area to grow wine um it takes so much energy so much effort the people that grow wine in the northern rhone are doing it from a labor of love. Um, there's not a huge amount of pleasure. It's all backbreaking and, and very, very intensive. Um, but it's an incredibly famous region. Um, it's been growing wine as long as many of the other areas in France. Um, and this particular producer, so Jabolais, is the largest private producer within the Croisemitage appellation. So um, we're kind of drinking in a way, the best of Croisemitage, a really, really good example. Um, it's from a particular vineyard site, which is the Thalabert vineyard. So that's what that domain Thalabert piece means there. Um, and this was planted by Jaboulet, by the, by the company. Uh, and the vines are about 40 to 60 years old. Um, so they own all those grapes. They make this wine themselves. Um, obviously, um, but they make it from their own estate grown grapes. There is another uh, producer very big here. You may have heard of them. They're a cooperative. So the Tain, T-A-I-N, um, and they produce more Croisomitage, but this is the largest private producer. Um, in terms of the vintage, because actually when you get into the Northern Rome, vintage is really important. 2017, the wine that we have here was very hot. And I won't go too much into vintage because some of you may have different ones, um, but this was a warm vintage. So Syrah grew perfectly well. Um, you can kind of smell it, but the one thing I would say is uh, if you do have both of the wines, an opportunity to have both of the glasses... Uh, now would definitely be a good time to compare them side by side, because if you smell the difference, it is quite, um, quite remarkable. For me, um, Syrah, which the first wine is made from in the north exclusively, is much more black fruited. It's also a lot more herbal. I don't know whether you're getting a bit of that, Catherine. Yeah, it's quite woody herbs as well. I think yeah. that's rosemary thyme, sort of a bit resonant. It arguably a bit more closed and I don't mean closed in a bad way it's just not as sort of exuberant and in your face whereas the Cote de Rhone if you have got it next to you but don't worry I'll talk about it in a second it's a much more immediate you can kind of smell juicy red fruits um and it's a bit more obvious um so those are the two differences I'm already getting on the smell color wise actually as well if we really want to go deep into it uh, the the uh, 2017 is obviously a bit older but it's certainly not got as bright a pink color it's going a little bit more rusty and red um rusty is probably not the right word it doesn't sound very appealing but it's got that it's got a more aged color to it um rather than the bright pink of the uh, of the Cote de Rhone um somebody's just commented on the chat they've got the 2014 yes so Karen, the lovely thing about these Northern Rome wines is particularly in the places like Croisomitage, which is not the top top, you know, we're not talking the sort of hundred pound, 200 pound wines, but you do get wines that are mid price, mid to premium price, um, and they age, you know, good Croisomitage ages really beautifully. So you can keep, um, you can keep hold of those. Um, I'll quickly... Oh, actually, I haven't tasted it yet. Goodness. Catherine, have you tasted yours? I have. I've been making some notes. So it's definitely the definitely the black fruit. Um, I think more of a sort of a bramble, black berry for me, um, and black currant. There's a little bit of blueberry, but I don't know if that's more that the, the woodiness of the herbs are giving that sort of quality to it as well. Imagining wandering through a sort of lovely no British countryside, are you? Mm. And with the, the smokiness of the oak as well, I think it's that, you know, if you're walking, if you're blackberry picking past some woods and someone's got a bonfire. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Great in. description, Catherine. Why don't we pay you to write on the back of the bottles? <laughs> no, I love it. Um, and immediately, yeah, the more you talk about it, the more I'm smelling the two, the differences are great. So, um, I will move on to the next one and then we can compare them. Um, so the Southern Rhone, 
we don't even have to go back to the map. We can imagine it. And I think um, I do have a picture of Van Sobe, but we can go on to that in a minute. But if you imagine the map of the Southern Rhone, it's that big um, flat expanse. So it's effectively actually where the um, glacier rattled through and pulled a load of sediment. So the soils are very different now. Here we go. Um, but this particular appellation where this Cote de Rhone is made is uh, don't quote me on this, but it's probably the most akin to the Northern Rhone of the Southern. And I'll go on to explain why in a minute. But um, there are other Southern Rhone areas, particularly Chateau Neuf de Pape, that make incredibly different wines to the North. They're chalk and cheese. This is a Cote de Rhone that actually has a little bit of a nod to the North. But I'll tell you about that in a sec. You come down this, what seems like not too far to drive, um, but actually the weather has changed completely. Down here, you are a victim of the Mistral wind. So this incredible wind that blows through. Um, it's a blessing and a curse. They have to grow a lot of the vines in Gobelet, like Catherine mentioned earlier, but that's just to protect them from the wind. But the reason it's a blessing and a curse is it does actually cool down some regions. Um, and also things like, um, dare I say, it, a lot of areas for the frost horrible frost we've just had in France you know industry damaging frost a lot of the southern Rome was actually sort of protected because the mistral was blowing so heavily that some areas actually the frost couldn't settle it, it I cannot tell you how hard it blows I can't open my car door sometimes it's blowing that hard um, but it's also incredibly sunny. So Grenache is king down here because it is like a sunbathing goddess. It loves the sun, but that also is a great variety that can get quite alcoholic. So you'll usually find at least one or 2% difference in the North and the South. Not always. And to be fair, they're converging because they're, they're doing things a bit differently, but naturally you will normally find that there is an alcoholic difference. Um, a little bit like um, Beaujolais, there's sort of a Cote de Rhone, then there's a Cote de Rhone Village, and Cote de Rhone Villages are, are deemed slightly better. Then there's Cote de Rhone Village plus a name, um, and then those are places like uh, Segare, for example, and those named villages are deemed even better. And then in the south, there are the crew. So there are some crew in the north, I think eight in the north, and there's nine in the south. And this particular wine, although it's a Cote de Rhone, so you could argue that it's at the bottom end of the tree, or I like to think of it as a pyramid, it's at the bottom of our pyramid, but it's actually from a producer called Domaine Jaume, and they are based in Van Sobe. And Van Sobe um, is a relatively new appellation. I think it was added in a crew. I think it was promoted in 2006, could be 2007. But the wines from here, from this particular producer that go into the Society's Cote de Rhone, are all from the Van Sobe area. So they're in the crew commune. It's just that some of the grapes are either too young um, to put into their Van Sobe crew. So some of the, the vineyards aren't old enough or they're delisted. So it might be that they're not planted to the correct specifications. Um, so basically you're drinking a imitation crew wine for a fraction of the price, which I think is fantastic. Um, the reason I said this is most akin to the north is that it's also grown at a little bit of altitude. So it's actually, Van Sobe is actually a 420 meter hill or mound. Now, I was actually looking for a place to get married, <laughs> um, which is a delayed wedding. It hopefully will happen this year, but I think it's looking less and less likely. But uh, last year we were due to get married in the Southern Rhone. And we actually, this is a picture I took from the church at the top, but it just gives you an idea of how high the village actually is. And everybody thinks the Southern Rhone is so flat and it's this big plain where everything gets hot. It's actually quite high up here. I found it really hard to find any other pictures. So I thought I'd throw in my wedding recce photo <laughs> to demonstrate. Um, but it does give you an idea of the altitude. And because of that, actually Syrah grows really beautifully. So whilst this wine is 80% Grenache, in the South, you are allowed to blend a lot more varieties. Cote de Rhone, I think, has 21 permitted varieties, or at least the region does. Um, but Syrah actually brings a lot to this. So it is still quite dark fruited. It's 20% Syrah. And it's actually got a, a little sprinkling um, of other bits and pieces. But it's 80% Grenache, 20% Syrah. And it's blended by Marcel, our buyer for Rhone, and he blends it every sort of February, March time. Um, and yes, it's, uh, he describes it as fresh. And I think that altitude brings that. It's got a little bit of, 
of freshness. So let me know what you think about that one as well. Catherine, mm. what do you think? Comparison between the two? I, I mean, very red in comparison. Um, it's got a lot of pep to it. I just wish I was having a barbecue. <laughs> is what I think about the, the society's coats are own. It's got that real, it's got a nice warmth to it. I mean, it's, what is it? It's 14, 14%. It's got a warmth, but it's not overpowering. Yeah, I mean, between the two, the North for me is thinking wine and the South is cuddling wine. <laughs> I always feel so comforted by the wines of the Southern Rhone. It's, I think Emma Briffitt always describes Grenache, um, who's on the tastings team. Emma Briffitt says Grenache is the cookie monster. It wants to give you a hug. And I think, yeah, it's not only a hug. It's just like indulgence. It's luscious. It's fruity. It's a little bit spicy. It's a little bit baking spices, all of those sorts of things. You want so. to sink into the glass as you're drinking it. Oh, yeah. You just want to recline further and further back when you're drinking the Southern Rhone. Um, but yes, so two incredibly different wines, technically from the same region. And I think that that for me is, is the, the complexity, but also a bit of a contradiction about the Rhone. I don't think you can call the Rhone the Rhone. I think it is very much the North and the South. Um, I'd love to hear what members thought. Whilst members are maybe jotting down, which we're not really comparing on price. That's a bit cruel, but I think we're probably not a million miles off on quality. Let me know if you tried them both and which your favourite was, north or south. Um, and I will quickly answer Andy Ashton's question, which was, what, you, what is your view on Vontu wines? Because I say um, Vontu is the way forward, Andy. <laughs> and I've been saying this for a long time. Um, and I think Janice Robinson agrees. Um, but the wines, as global warming happens, we've obviously, um, Alan's mentioned that it's got a lot of alcohol. Um, that is a major problem that's happening in the Southern Rhone. You know, we've got um, alcohol levels rising because the sunshine is, is, and the growing seasons are longer, producing more sugar in the grapes, that becomes alcohol. And quite frankly, um, the Rhone is going to continue to produce naturally 15% wines that's just what's going to happen in the south so producers are now being really really careful about what they do so they're picking grapes earlier they are finding places like van Sobe where there's altitude i say finding it's been around forever but they, they're now concentrating on altitude and vontu is a great place with altitude in the southern rome and it's not a crew um, but it is an appellation that's increasingly growing there's a lot of young winemakers there because it's not a crew there's no rules so there's some beautiful wines being made of all sorts of varieties i tried an amazing merlot from there um when i was last there so vontu is a really really interesting place but other than that the key i think to the southern rhone in terms of where you're shopping now is finding producers that are taking an active interest in not making jammy wines um, and that's big on Marcel's agenda as well, you know, making sure that producers are doing things like pruning differently to make sure that they're not having too many leaves that then create pho too much photosynthesis, all those sorts of things. So there's masses you can do to help the issue of global warming and the alcohol levels. But for me, the most obvious choice, and I don't know why everyone is literally, I didn't mean to say it, this, this is a pun, but I would be mm. running for the hills. You know, <laughs> if you're growing wine on the plan de jour on that flat bit where you're basically in a glorified solarium, then I would be getting, getting some altitude, getting some cooler, you know, cooling the temperature by a couple of degrees is gonna make a massive difference. So there we go. Um, whereabouts in the Southern Rhone does the Deme Society's Domaine de Seminier come from? I'm not sure, Paul. I'll find out for you, though. Domaine de Seminier. I'll find out. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? I know that we have had a couple of other questions from previous wines that we could rattle through now as well, Catherine. But I'd be keen to know if members have any thoughts. Pop them in the chat. Why don't we go back to those couple of questions? And while we're, we're answering those, let us know what you think and we can... We can come back to you in the chat. So I think one of the questions we had was um, back on the Pinot Gris. So whether there is a some Pinot Gris from New Zealand from the Wine Society, a good challenge to Alsace. We do actually have a couple of um, New Zealand Pinot Gris. We've got the Three Terraces and the Kumu River Pinot Gris. I think I would say the Kumu is probably the probably more of a challenge to Alsace Pinot Gris than perhaps the Three Terraces is. Um, I think they just make it in that slightly richer style 
and try and take the influence from Alsace. Would you agree, Anna? Yeah, and I also think that um, New Zealand are not looking to make Pinot Grigio. They are looking to make Pinot Gris. There's definitely an active decision to make wines in the Alsace style. And what you'll find with New World producers, if it says Pinot Grigio, but it's from another country, that they're, they're doing that on purpose. They're saying we're making this in a light, fruity, northern Italian style. If they're writing Pinot Gris, which these most New Zealand producers are doing, is because they're trying to emulate the Alsace. So... Um, yes. And then Alan Pierce, what does the longer dock Pinot Gris taste like? If you've, again, this comes down to altitude for me. Longer dock at altitude, they can grow almost anything as long as you've got enough height. So, um, yeah, I think a longer dock Pinot Gris for me, delicious. Um, Catherine, we then had a question a, about Bordeaux varietals as yeah. well. So I can't find the question, but you might be able to repeat it. Yeah, so it was whether the newly permitted varieties um, that are now permitted in Bordeaux, whether they'll be grown everywhere in Bordeaux, or will some be focused on the right or the left bank? That was from Leslie and Joy. Thank you, that was a great question because it is something for the Bordelais to consider. Now, I can't speak for the entire Bordelais as to whether they will be, um, where they will be wanting to grow those varieties or what sort of style of wine. But if you look at a few of the varieties that are now newly permitted, you get a bit of an idea of to where would be perhaps best place for them to consider growing. So you've got things like Turiga Nacional, so often found, um, well, it's found in, in Portugal and is a, a variety used in the production of port. It's quite thick skinned, highly tannic. Again, you've got Marcelon, which is a Cabernet Sauvignon Grenache um, sort of hybrid. Um, Aranora, which is again, Cabernet Sauvignon and Tanat. Um, and those for the red. So you would, I would imagine the left would be best placed to grow those because they are the, the more tannic varieties. Um, and just based on the fact that Cabernet Sauvignon is grown predominantly on the left bank in Bordeaux at the moment, that would make most sense to me. However, with the um, the changes in, in climate change and, you know, the um, environment and dependent on the style that they're wanting, again, it could influence where they're growing it. And then perhaps if you're looking at the whites, one of the new varieties permitted is Petit Manson. And that produces some really nice sweet wines if it's used well. So again, that could be down in the Dan Sauterne region, like sort of on the left bank as well. So it it's not a, a definitive of where they're going to be grown or produced, but I think based on the varieties that are now permitted, you can get a bit of an idea um, of where they might likely be seen in the future. And also now that they're newly permitted, doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to be clamoring to actually, um, you know, grow these vines and produce these wines. There may still be a little bit of resistance from the Bordelais as to whether they want to include these in their blends. You surprise me, Catherine. <laughs> They're quite traditional, so we'll see. We'll see. What <laughs> in <the coming> years. <laughs> Red tape, French wine. I don't believe you. <laughs> Slow on the uptake. Um, Lovely. I think we've got one more tiny question. Oh, sorry. It was coming back to the Domaine de Seminier because that is actually from Val Rea. Um, Val Rea is um, probably five minutes north. Um, yeah, about maybe five, maximum 10 minutes north in the car of Van Sobe, where we've just been tasting. It's a lower altitude, so it's not quite as um, fresh or refreshing as a Van Sobe, but they make lovely wine there. And actually, Val Rea is um, relatively undiscovered. Um, in terms of an international audience. So the value that you can get from around there, from Grignan, which is just just um, sort of, I'm having trouble with my north, south, east and west to the west of that area. Um, again, amazing value. There's plenty of value to be found in the Southern Rhone, I think. Um, but yeah, Valeria is spot on. So I hope that answers the question. I think therein, we ran over by 15 minutes. We knew we would, Catherine. We can't help but talk about wine too much, can we? No. I think we, we learned from this that we need more time. Yeah, we've done one hour 15, just so you know, for some of our upcoming events that are like this. And I think in hindsight, we could have done with one hour 15 on this one as well. But I hope, thank you all for, well, thanks for sticking around and joining us. And I do hope that you enjoyed some wines, tried some new ones. Um, we've certainly had a lot of fun presenting them and a lot of fun 
I've now got six mini bottles to make my way through the rest of the week. It's so, worth saying that all of these will keep really nicely. So don't feel like you do have to finish them all this evening, although, of course, it's your prerogative, but they will keep for a few days. It will be um, a lovely treat. You could have sort of one an evening, couldn't you? <laughs> a week of wine, Catherine. <laughs> um but yes I think that's probably it from Catherine and I what would you what do you say Catherine I I agree I mean thank you all for joining us I hope you have enjoyed the wines if you've had them with you or if you've not had them this evening you're now tempted to to try them lovely well I think uh Gil's going to unmute you so that we can all have a nice cheers and wish each other a lovely <laughs> a lovely rest of the week so uh Catherine it's a cheers from me and from me cheers <laughs> cheers Good night. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.